Welcome back to Echo Ridge in another episode of our Maximum Difficulty Achievement Run. We have a lot on the schedule today, and most of it is self-induced pain, and not necessarily dupe-induced. We're sitting at cycle 783, and just like our rocket is aptly named, we're taking it slow and steady. Remember the first hundred cycles, we didn't do just about anything other than getting the carnivore achievement. And then from there, it's all about playing catch-up. I mean, we've built two different spawns, and today, we're about to build a third. We're also still using this antiquated system, and it's one of the reasons why Tier 3 research is still lagging behind. And I want to get it improved before we start on that next level of research, whenever Angry Forest is finished making all the databanks. Speaking of which, I had to show you this one. We put a couple of extra statues in here, and we have a hanging pot. Because I wanted to add, you know, a little bit of extra decor to try to help them out. And then I noticed they're actually sitting at a 35 morale. And part of the reason why is because they're sitting in gorgeous decor, giving them plus 12 to an already good morale. Well, by clicking on the decor overlay, you can sort of see why. They're maxed out on decor sitting here, partly because Angry Forest is giving a plus 65 because their outfit and the fact that they're innately stylish. And remember, the innately stylish gives them a plus 25 decor, but they're also wearing the wonderful overalls. So pretty much wherever Angry Forest goes, they're getting the maximum decor per tile. And while that is great, we are up to 382 databanks, which is the reason for this mission. They still have 370,000 calories worth of berry sludge, which would last 185 cycles, but they definitely won't be able to be up there for that long because we're using the gas cargo canister to provide oxygen, and with 2.7 tons worth of oxygen remaining inside the cargo canister, that'll give them about 46 total cycles that they can remain in space. Not to mention that we still have an Atmos suit here that has over 70 kilos worth of oxygen, so even if I manage to forget about Angry Forest, they'll be just fine. Speaking of oxygen though, it's just about time to upgrade this system. Because of the temps sitting around 30, 32 degrees, all the temperature in this area has been driving up to where the oxygen's finally getting delivered at 27 to about 29 degrees, which is not too bad. But as soon as it gets hotter, it's gonna be competing with all of our water, which will be counterproductive. Now, I do have a plan, considering all of this water is already being chilled by these two aqua tuners. Which, by the way, we're gonna have to get in here and repair this one. More on that in a minute. But we can use the 29 degree water to sort of keep an electrolyzer cool before that water is fed into an electrolyzer. Which is sort of necessary if we want to use copper ore. Alternatively, we can make the electrolyzer out of steel. Allow it to get as hot as we want and then just cool the oxygen. I haven't figured out which way I want to go yet. Speaking of which, steel production's going great. We're up over six tons, and more is coming. We still have a little over three tons worth of iron ore. We're converting all that into iron. Not to mention we have 600 kilos worth of lime, plenty of refined carbon. So the only limiting factor is the iron ore. We did finish putting the rock crusher in here, so it's turning all the fossil poke shell molds, and eggshells over to lime. We also have it turning salt into table salt. Now, I am not going to put this on do it forever, because it would literally take them forever. We have 8 tons of salt sitting here where the nuclear waste hits, and almost 20 tons here. Not to mention, whenever the brine or salt water doesn't get refined over in the nuclear power plant industrial sauna water purifier, the desalinators have also managed to turn out just a little bit of salt with almost a hundred tons sitting here. So needless to say, we're never gonna run out of salt, table salt, or sand. Speaking of running out of items, we've started sending some igneous rock over from Inverilin just to keep these hatch ranches going. We've reduced the number down to four, quite frankly, because these coal generators are probably never gonna run again. Despite the fact they're sitting on 9040, you can see that our smart batteries don't budge off of 20 kilojoules very often. We're literally burning off extra hydrogen just to make sure it doesn't overflow into this system here. And that's because we have 10 steam turbines pretty much running flat out. I am keeping an eye on this because this steam turbine that we were trying to inject some more heat into is running flat out. So we want to make sure we have everything equalized as far as thermal management. 
because all this cooling is doing a decent job dumping heat in, but I am a little worried about it getting too hot. It's heading back into the refinery at around 230 degrees and coming out around 280. And in the iron's case, it's raising the temp by 61 degrees, which means the naphtha is actually gaining 10 degrees in heat each time it goes through. Over on the steel side, the naphtha raises in temp by 106 degrees. Luckily, some of it sits on the outside for a little bit, but as you can see, if we start injecting 250 degree naphtha in, which we're doing right now, means it's gonna come out at over 300 degrees. And that is no bueno for sure, because while we do have a little bit of headroom with naphtha all the way up to 538 degrees, I'd really prefer if the metal refineries didn't become sour gas boilers. So there's everything to get caught up. In the meantime, we also had a colony achievement, the moral high ground. Have a duplicate in one rocket survive in space for 10 cycles with a morale of a 25 or higher. Nicely done. We also have a new duplicate inside this pod that we're going to grab in the form of a Camille. This Camille is good at tidying, rocketry, and building, with their only negative being they don't like to do any of the cooking. Welcome to the colony, our 18th duplicate, John Archer. Speaking of our earlier conversations on decor, we have a small problem here. I was adding five more suit docks to this run here because, well, we have 15 duplicates sitting on this colony, and yet I have not seen an idle message in quite some time. So I'm starting to look where we can make some improvements. Hence the reason adding more suit docks. Well, while I was doing that, I realized our infinite storage is right there in the path for the duplicates to get in and out here. And while you may not think that's a very big deal, our infinite storage has a very, very bad decor at minus 632. Most of it being caused by the debris. So what we're going to try to do is add some more positive decor just to combat this. I like its position because it'll be easy enough for dupes on the outside to grab goodies and it's centrally located for the dupes to get goodies for use on the inside. So what we're going to do is put in some arrow pots, except we're also going to be using what little bit of diamond we have and making them out of diamond for the plus 100% to decor. Now, this will give us, theoretically, plus 20 decor in a radius of four tiles. Not enough to combat the negative decor being caused by the debris, but every little bit helps. The other option we had is possibly putting in a landscape canvas, but the landscape canvas is only going to give us plus 15 decor. So I think the best bang for the buck here is going to be the arrow pots. We'll put down three right there and then load them up with some plants. Right now it's about 29 degrees here, so I don't necessarily want to put anything with a max of 30. Can't put the Tranquil Toe Seeds because they have a max of minus one. The Mirth Leafs will work out well right here. So it's not going to be a big change, but I think there is one more thing we might be able to do, and that is by dropping the debris. Remember, the debris also has a range, and it looks like that range is two the tile it's on, and one more. So we're going to build a little platform here and then just deconstruct this right here, which means we're going to have to get rid of the sunny retro flower pot. The duplicates will still be able to reach in there and grab it because it's only two tiles lower. In fact, I don't think we even need these tiles here, and that way the carbon dioxide doesn't end up sinking in there. But now the duplicates can run right by and get that maximum decor. We'll even put a nice little plastic ladder here. And I'm going to start putting all these little decor changes in and around the colony. We saw how powerful decor can be considering Angry Forest has a 35 morale. Everybody else on our main colony has everything from 36 all the way down to about 21. This system works so much better too because even the duplicate trying to get some of these materials only has to stand right here, which is still sitting at a max 120 decor. In that same breath, we're also going to be upgrading our Great Hall, except we're not going to be using diamond. We're going to be using glass because we only have four tons of diamond, so I'd rather conserve it. We'll go every other tile with the arrow pots. It looks like we're running a little low on glass, but don't worry, our new glass forge is churning out some glass right now. Additionally, I think we can do a little bit better inside of our nature reserve that everybody has to run through when they wake up. So we'll add more arrow pots here as we go as well. A minor update that happened in the background is we added another apothecary and put another medical storage refrigerator next to it as well, except this time we're holding allergy medicine. Poor Eilart here has allergies, which means 
they get sick and start sneezing uncontrollably whenever they're around the floral scent. Well, considering every few cycles whenever these bristle blossoms come to harvest, we get a bomb of floral scent, we figured we'd help Eilert out a little bit. Not something you necessarily would have to do, especially in a normal difficulty setting, but here in maximum difficulty, whenever Eilert was having a sneezing fit and suffering from the allergies, it would raise their stress, which just makes them more of an ineffective dupe. And I'm trying to do everything I can to see an idle message. Most people think idle messages are bad, and while the intent behind their statement is correct, it's not necessarily what you want to look for. Because when you don't see any idle messages, you have no idea how backed up on errands the duplicants are, without clicking on one of them and going down their errand list. And especially for me, who on every episode we want to accomplish X amount of things, knowing where the duplicants are, as far as being ahead of the curve or behind the curve on their errands, is important. Now, some things that I've done, for instance, having this rock crusher set on four and a huge backlog of salt to table salt will prevent duplicants from idling for quite some time. But this here would only take up one duplicant's errand. So while a duplicant's doing this, we should still see an idle message pop up every now and again. Sadly, we don't. So I'm going to keep looking for more and more duplicants, which also means I'm going to need more places to sleep which means we're going to have to work on this little system here. To start off, we're not going to let anybody go through this door from right to left, because we're going to want them to go down through here and out through the nature reserve in the new barracks. And sadly, I have not unlocked any more cots from the blueprints, so we're going to go back to the stargazers. And I know this isn't the cleanest of all systems, but being able to force them through this area and starting their day off with a plus six morale, not to mention... We're going to put a bunch of arrow pots in here, which is also going to decor bomb them. It's just much too good of a benefit to ignore. Another thing on the agenda, because we don't have enough to do, is it's time to get a deep freezer. Even though we're running berry sludge, and we have berry sludge for days, we still need a way to protect the ingredients to go into the berry sludge. And as you can see, we're losing a lot of bristle berries and sleet wheat. Not to mention we still have the occasional pieces of barbecue, and so I think our kitchen needs a renovation too. Which has me thinking if we put the electrolyzer, say, here, we might be able to put a cooling system here, and we could use one of the combination cooling systems that has a thermo aqua tuner and a thermo regulator that we could use for a deep freezer. Of course, we already have a system here that's working and functional. So if I'm going to add a thermo aqua tuner and thermo regulator, it actually makes sense to do it right here. And then I can use the thermo aqua tuner to keep the system cool no matter what. I think that might be a better plan. To start off with though, I think we're finally going to have to get rid of some of this. Clear this area out, which unfortunately is going to waste a bunch of this uranium ore. But we'll sweep it up and deliver it off to the bees. Speaking of which, we're up to 14.6 tons of enriched uranium. Yeah, I think we're going to be okay. Because right now with that much enriched uranium, we could turn the bees off and have enough fuel for the research reactor for over 1400 cycles. I finally caught Eilart in the middle of an allergy attack and you can see that it's causing 15% stress per cycle. It also has plus 10 to sneeziness, but the sneeziness is not such a big deal for the allergies because, well, you can't spread your allergies to another duplicate. Next update we have in the colony is on the material study terminal. We've got a plan. Now, whether this is a good one or not, well, we'll figure that out later. We added a couple Radbolt joint plates. One coming into this room and one going out. And the reason why is because you can put automation on these Radbolt reflectors. So when we turn these Radbolt generators on and we start generating a lot more Radbolts than what those Weezworts are able to provide, we're going to be able to direct them wherever we want. In this case, we're going to have the Radbolts come out, go through here. We'll point this down once it's done being built, it'll hit this rad bolt reflector, and then come out through here and slide all the way over to hit this rad bolt joint plate. If this material study terminal needs rad bolts, it'll be sending a red signal. Otherwise, if it's full, it sends out a green signal, which we have going to a not gate, which will then send the red signal to the rad bolt reflector, which means it'll ignore incoming rad bolts. So all those extra rad bolts are simply just going to bypass the reflector 
hit this rad bolt joint plate, and head off into space. Not a perfect system, but considering we already had this infrastructure into place, and we have more rad bolts than we can shake a stick at, I mean, this one rad bolt generator is gonna give us 685 per cycle. We're gonna be able to churn through that research pretty quickly. And I'm sure some of you are noticing some damage here. Once they get this repaired, we're gonna put some more regular tiles here. Because remember, those tiles are just here for radiation protection, not necessarily meteor protection. But as our steel goes up, we're gonna start putting bunker tiles on the top layer of everywhere a meteor could hit, all the way across the top of our spaceport. Now, it won't be perfect because even if you put a bunker tile here and a meteor hits it, it'll still damage the tiles around it, but it's a good start. Speaking of which, we're up to 10 tons of steel now. Over on Inverilin, we've been doing, well, a lot of digging. We've almost cored out the entire place. And unfortunately, they have no iron ore, nor do they have any rust that we could grab the iron from. We also do silly things. While these dupes are bored, they can start picking up all the stuff and they send it over to this automatic dispenser, where eventually we're gonna put some nice shipping system on that whenever we're ready to send some stuff over to the spy teleporter input, we'll have a conveyor loader here with an auto sweeper, and the auto sweeper will just pick up whatever we need and send it directly over. That's a long-term late game sort of thing though, but we'll eventually get there. But I mention all that because we're down to 88 tons of igneous rock on this planetoid, and that's keeping the hatches going, which I think I got sidetracked earlier before, but the reason we're keeping hatches going, because we still need all that coal for not only refined carbon, but eventually diamond. Because we're going to be throwing all these rad bolts into diamond presses, and then taking the diamond, putting it inside some drill cones, where we're going to be able to head out into space and get all the renewable resources we'll ever need. But I think that's probably about 500 cycles away. Maybe sooner, if old Angry will hurry up with the databanks. As a reminder, please remember to change the direction of your rad bolt reflectors, otherwise you'll have some sort of infinite loop going. There we go, and once again, these are go this way, and here comes a delivery of over 400 rad bolts bypassing the reflector, because this material study terminal is full, because we don't have any research going, so we're going to grab this last tier 3 research, and then we'll start getting through all the requirements of the tier four, even though we don't have the databanks yet. Here's the start of our deep freezer system and our spawn cooler. We're just gonna turn some of these gas pipes into radiant. And then I'm gonna drive the temperature down in this area. Actually, with this being full of carbon dioxide, it wouldn't have the best transferring. It'd be clean, but I don't think it'd be very effective. I might be able to turn this area here into a radiator plate. That might be a little bit better. Or maybe even over here, because we have the room, and we wouldn't have to move the gas pipes a lot. The problem with that is, well, we just don't have a lot of metal tiles. I suppose we could sacrifice a little bit of steel, but steel is not the best. Aluminum really is. We can see here the difference. Aluminum has a thermal conductivity of 205 and a specific E capacity of 0.91. The steel is only 54 and 0.490. Our other option would be copper, and it's not much better than the steel. What about cobalt? Cobalt is a decent second place to the aluminum. Unfortunately, we only have 430 kilos worth of cobalt. Let me see what I can scrounge up in terms of metal. All right, we still have 136 tons of copper ore over on Verilin. If I can send some of that over, I can make more refined copper and then try to replace a bunch of things that are made out of cobalt or aluminum. Yeah, that's a plan. We finally have an idle message, although this one doesn't count, because it's John Archer that's idle. John Archer is not allowed to leave the base, so we're going to have them pick up these things here that are being dropped off, and they'll drop them into the automatic dispenser. Now for a bit of trickery. We mentioned this area before because of this little damage here, and that's because all of the salt water that doesn't end up going to the nuclear power plant industrial sauna and water purifying system, which by the way, I really need a new name for that, so please give me some recommendations down in the comments below, is all heading over to our salt water tank, which means it's coming in at 94 degrees, which means this thermo aqua tuner is running pretty much flat out. In fact, I even adjusted it to where these two thermo sensors were not set at the same thing. This one's at 20, this one's at 15. 
because when they were set the same at 20 and 20, more often than not, this thermo aqua tuner wouldn't have anything to chill. The problem comes into play, A, that we're not getting ahead of the curve, obviously, because both thermo aqua tuners are running all the time, but it also means this water is starting to heat up again. We're up at 30.1 degrees. And because of that, once again, all of our bristle blossoms are now too warm. So to start off with, we're just going to disconnect this line right here. I don't want any more hot salt water coming in here until everything gets back to normal. And some of you might be saying, well, it's because you're running salt water through those coolant lines. Remember, we don't have anything that's really better. Salt water has a specific heat capacity of 4.1, a thermal conductivity of 0 0.60. Even the almighty polluted water is only marginally better at the specific heat capacity. So until we get some beautiful supercoolant, which is somewhere out here on the star map, it's sort of going to have to do. But unfortunately, a third aqua tuner wouldn't help. And here's the reason why. This salt water is coming in at 31 degrees. It's going through the first aqua tuner and coming back out at 17, which means by the time it comes out through the second aqua tuner, it's coming out at 3 degrees. We have a freezing point at minus 7, so a third aqua tuner would end up just breaking in the pipes. We are still going to get in here though, just for a minute, by putting down some wonderful naphtha, because I want to repair the aqua tuner and pick up all this salt, you know, to make it look all nice. I always forget to make these a little bit larger whenever we're going to put both a thermal aqua tuner and a thermal regulator in them. The reason why is where we want the automation sensors. Oh no, not again. Not again. Can we please not starve to death, Drekos? I'm trying. Cooler water is coming. Right now it's at 30.5, which is just about exactly where it's at. I've stopped all the flow of the previous hot water coming in, so it's only a matter of time. It should start going down a little bit. One of the issues that caused the thermal aqua tuners to fall behind is because the cool salt sauce geyser is dormant and will be for another 10 cycles. So it's only about 20 cycles worth of cooling that we need to make up for. I'm starting to think, because all this water is nice and cold here, that if I were to weave these in and out before the loop got to the rest of this, it might be beneficial. Because by the time the water gets here, it's at 32 degrees, which it's then filtering through, and by then it's already too warm. When the brine's coming out, it's able to re-chill this. Let me see what I can do with the snippers. Here we go. Now the water's gonna come in go through like this and we'll separate it there and now we get a bunch of the cool water chilling this whole tank down before it heads into the hot salt water tank because ultimately this is the only tank that we really care about being cold and there might be some people to say well don't even bother cooling the other two tanks well I don't want to necessarily do that because remember these radiant liquid pipes are also providing the equilibrium from when this brine geyser is going off sending some of that chill all the way over here as well. I think this system is going to help us almost immediately. The salt water is now coming in at around 9 degrees and leaving at 32, which means all of that chill was dumped off right inside this tank. And look at this, the naphtha has been dropped off so I can make some bad decisions. Hopefully this works without causing much of an issue. Looks like we found another dupe. I was on the fence because they're unconstructive, which is never really a great thing. But we do have a lot of farming on this colony, and at a minimum, Catalina would be pretty good at that. Plus, they have Grease Monkey and Increased Cuisine. Welcome to the colony, our 19th duplicate, Andy. We're going to put Andy directly into improved farming so we can give them their hat, and they'll be able to work in the Bristle Blossom Farms, which will help relieve some of the labor here, well, once they start growing again. We do still have plenty of room inside the Great Hall with a total of 22 mess tables, which I think will get us up to the number that we want to, at least at this colony, and that's 20. We also made a retrofit by putting the party line phone in, which is going to help, because now people are going to be able to call Angry Forest, which is going to be able to give Angry Forest an even higher morale. Because remember, when Angry Forest was just talking to themselves a few cycles ago, it was only giving them a plus one to morale. But now, because they're in space, both parties are going to be receiving plus four to morale. Which reminds me, we might as well upgrade the one over here on Envarolin as well. We don't need any water coolers anymore. Okay, bad things happened. We at least got the thermal aqua tuner fixed, but yeah, 
all the steam just came rushing out. So we're going to have to mop that up, pick up all this, and now there's only grams of steam. We'll end up fixing it, don't worry. We're grabbing some salt water off this line here in order to get the steam pressure back where we're comfortable with it inside the room. Once we're happy with the pressure, we'll grab all the salt once again and then seal it back up. No harm, no foul. In the meantime, we have found yet another dupe, and this one's a little special because they're a meep. We're gonna add another cook to the repertoire, and this meep is decent at cooking and supplying, and their only negative is they got a little bit of the rumble tummies. Welcome to the colony, our 20th duplicate, Aiden Olson. Now, Aiden starts with art fundamentals, except I don't want any crude artwork to happen to appear in the colony. So the first thing we're gonna do to Aiden is skill scrub them. Where do I keep putting that skill scrubber? Now this may seem to be largely unnecessary, but trust me, it's for the best. And if you really think about it, the skill scrubber might be sort of like a fun amusement park ride. I mean, they look like they're having a decent time in there. The water in the pipes is now coming back out at 27 degrees. So we could just wait a little while and eventually the temperature in this area would cool back down. Instead, we're gonna force the issue and put a few ice temperature shift plates down. That'll quickly cool the area and then allow all the water and its thermal capacity to sort of take over. Look how happy Aiden is now that they've been freshly skill scrubbed. There's sparkles streaking everywhere. Now we have two skill points. We could put them back into art fundamentals and it wouldn't cost us any morale, but instead we're gonna put them into grilling and grilling too. And we'll eventually put them back into decorating. Until then, they're gonna have a slight case of amnesia. When we printed Aiden out of the printing pod, we earned another achievement. This one is for having 20 duplicates. Now the description on this achievement has not been updated in quite some time, because you can see it says, have at least 20 living duplicates living in the colony at one time. Well, there's not 20 duplicates living in this colony. Now granted, we have 20 duplicates across the star map, with a couple over on Inverilin, and then one in the rocket, Either way, that's another achievement checked off the books. And as usual, I completely forgot about this. So let me go ahead and disconnect it right now. There looks to be way too many kilos worth of steam. In the construction of our deep freezer, we're going to make some kitchen changes. Namely, I don't want the evolution chamber over here because this is where I want the deep freezer. So we're going to have to move the evolution chamber. Not a big deal. All we really need to do is move the conveyor chute, connect it in here and then deconstruct that conveyor chute. Now everything's gonna be dropped off here. Oh, I just realized all the bristleberries were heading to the evolution chamber and that's where they were being picked up. We'll have to change that around later. And then we're gonna move all the water over here by using a sneaky little method of just raising the water level where it'll start flowing and then dump everything in here. We have a brick right here to make sure it doesn't go this way. And if we're still a little short, we can use the bottle emptier to put water back in. Look at this, it's working like a charm. Other than everybody getting the soggy feet, no big deal. Work down here is going well. We're waiting for some steel delivery, despite the fact that we have 14 tons, because once again, we are really behind on dupe labor. We have enough aluminum to make one tile. While I have the copper up to six tons, now I just gotta find, Oh, look at this. All these mess tables are made out of aluminum. Sorry guys, you're gonna have to move your meals. Now this color is like a darker sort of weird color. Oh, all these doors are also made out of aluminum. Oh, this is easy. My goodness, is every pneumatic door in this colony made out of aluminum? What were you thinking? I'm happy to report that we are no longer under risk for the Drekos to go extinct on the colony for the second time in the playthrough. By doing that little bit of recycling, we've been able to get up to 3.6 tons worth of aluminum ore, and we're gonna turn every last bit of it into refined aluminum. Oh my, I just realized that all these conveyor rails are also all aluminum ore. That is a lot. And then there's silly little things like this that are just holdovers from a time long ago. And this is a mixture of aluminum and copper. Time to reclaim all those resources. Here's another example here. Instead of just going down from the auto sweeper and spending two tiles worth of conductive wire, we chose to spend six. We'll fix that. Same goes here. It's on the same line, but instead of spending the two, we spent five. 
Now, most of this is not because of just straight negligence. It's because the systems and the power grid has changed so much. But that's a friendly reminder to make sure you go around and take a look. Because you might be pleasantly surprised of where you can save. Especially when you're sitting with this much spaghetti. Look at all this. Look, don't judge me. We've had a bit of a time. The next step in our deep freezer is building the vacuum so we can get in here and work. We're going to use, once again, another soft lock using the naphtha. And this one's going to be rather important because when we drop the naphtha down, I only want it to be exactly one tile worth of naphtha. That way we don't make a mess in here. Not that it'd be a big deal. We could mop it, but still. But this way, all the naphtha that's excess from one tile should flow this way. Then once we know this is all secure, we can put a nice metal tile in here, the conveyor chute in here, and we'll be good to go. Now that we're no longer sending phosphorite over to the Weezworts up here, we've got even more rail that we're going to be able to reclaim, which is good because we're going to need some changes for the deep freezer. So we'll grab all of this here and this here. We still have phosphorite going into the fertilizer synthesizer, but all of this is more rail that we're going to be able to reclaim. So we have our naphtha here, which means I'm supposed to be confident to be able to open this up and know that it's going to be a vacuum. It's only 7.8 kilos. Look at that! The soft lock is such a beautiful invention. We have a couple of steel gas pipes going in here, one of which is going to cool down this metal tile that the food's all going to sit on. The other one is going to cool the environment. And already we're going to need a change in these conveyor systems because that's going to go there. And while we do want rails coming out of each side, just in case we want to use them in the future, we don't want it connected to the evolution chamber quite yet. I've got a plan for that a little later. Pip, I will leave you in the deep freezer. You need to go. Move. Oh no. I think the Pip's stuck because of the NAFTA. I'm sorry, but I am not doing this all over again. Oh, there you go. It was about to be bad news bears for you. With all the construction complete, we have a wonderful vacuum still, and everything is the way it's supposed to, so we can just close it in just like that. I had almost made a mistake because I had forgotten the steam turbine exhaust vent, but this actually works out a little bit better because we're going to raise this sensor up by one and put the vent right here. I couldn't put the vent right here because it's a part of the loop that's going to help keep the steam turbine cold. We're also working on this little area here, we have most of the lines in, all made out of aluminum. And then the radiant gas pipes are going in. Those are made out of steel. We're just going to basically move all the oxygen through it and then send it right back up towards its original path. As for the deep freezer line, it actually doesn't have too long of a run. It comes out of the thermal regulator. It's going to keep going up where it chills down the deep freezer where, oh my goodness. Oh, there's naphtha sitting in here. I'm pretty sure naphtha is not considered a sterile atmosphere. Give me a minute. This is actually a bigger pain than you might think because this naphtha is not going to move off this tile. So we're going to have to refill in this tile, which means we're going to have to get rid of the conveyor chute. Well, this is wonderful. The naphtha was just completely destroyed inside this tile because now there's carbon dioxide in here, which means there was probably carbon dioxide sitting in this tile. And that's the reason why the naphtha didn't go up with the tile. You might think that, well, we can seal it in, then deconstruct this tile, which is true because you can corner build and deconstruct tiles, but unfortunately you cannot corner build buildings, such as the conveyor chute. All right, this time we have 13 kilos worth of naphtha. Let's try it again, but we're gonna wait for all this carbon dioxide to leave because I think that's what was interfering. Let's help this process out by putting a nice little airflow tile right there. Okay, there's a little bit of carbon dioxide floating around, but I don't think it should stop us. Let's try this again. Please work, please. Well. Second time wasn't the charm. So this time we're going to try doing the exact same thing, except over here. Here we go. I'm thinking because the mechanics of the game typically send things up and over in a sort of clockwise direction. I think in this case, it was trying to push it everything over here. So when that didn't work, it pushed the naphtha over here. So if we're right, when we push this up, the naphtha should be in one of these two tiles. Fingers crossed. We already have the hydrogen flowing. We just grabbed a little bit off of our oxygen line, nice and easy. We're going to start off by cooling it down to minus 20. You can do it, John. You can do it. Oh, why are you the way you are? All right, this time it's really going to work. We're going to put naphtha in this tile over here and lock it in. Just a little bit of naphtha makes a nice little soft lock. 
and it won't leave this tile. So now when we dig this one out, we'll dig this one out, and to remove the lock, we can have everything already finished being built. There we go. It only took us four tries. Learning is occurring. Finally, at last, we have a vacuumed out deep freezer. This metal tile is already down to minus 16 degrees. We can get all of this cleaned up and we're ready for a kitchen reno. Our oxygen cooling system is being loaded up with some brine. We just happen to have two tiles here. We'll bridge it on as the normal and then fire up this aqua tuner. We'll start it off at say 15 degrees. I think that's fair for some oxygen. It'll be cooling down this radiator plate and making sure the steam turbine stays cold. And we have all the oxygen awkwardly weaving through the plate and heading back into the bridges that they normally would have gone in. And at a minimum, all the oxygen gets to go through at least six radiator tiles. Already the radiator plate's sitting at 11 degrees. Oh, I love the thermo aqua tuner and I really love some aluminum metal tiles. Our auction is leaving the radiator system between 13 and 15 degrees. Dare I say, between these systems here and this system here, we should no longer have any more heat issues once it all gets caught up. This side is a little bit slower than the rest because the water starts off pretty chill here and by the time it goes through all of these tiles, it's a little warmer. We've just dropped off a little bit of bleach stone into our perfect vacuum to fill this environment with chlorine. I get a lot of questions of why do I use chlorine and why not use something like hydrogen? Well, for two reasons. One, if there are a little bit of germs sitting on the food before this thing gets down to deep freezing temps, it'd kill those germs. But additionally, because bleach stone is a lot more portable, so it's easier for me just to throw a little bit of bleach stone inside the conveyor loader and it just ends up in there. And that way I don't have to play any deconstruct the pipe with the hydrogen in it or anything like that. Both methods work just fine. This is just my personal preference. The only thing I have to do is make sure the temperature stays between minus 18 and 34 and everything will be in a sterile environment and deep frozen. Now we have just a couple of auto sweepers in here to make sure the whole kitchen system works. Right now, the only thing connected to the deep freezer is this conveyor loader, but we're about to change that. I just realized that these auto sweepers can see this conveyor loader more on that in a minute, but I have to flip this thing upside down because this auto sweeper and this auto sweeper are going to be able to get into the deep freezer to grab the ingredients, but they're not supposed to be able to see in there. Hence the reason I have these blocks here. This auto sweeper has no line of sight for this tile, so I can flip the conveyor loader. And since its point of interest tile is this one here, that auto sweeper will not be able to load any food in here because this auto sweeper is only responsible for getting the ingredients this auto sweeper is responsible for taking the completed food and putting it inside the deep freezer. Now, once we have a solid filter, I'll be able to take all the eggs and put them in the evolution chamber and all the ingredients and put them in the deep freezer. For now though, we're gonna have to use a small duct tape solution. We could have everything being sent on separate lines, but that would cost a lot more in ore, ore that we don't have. So instead, we're just gonna daisy chain it. And what I mean by that is all the bristle berries and sleet wheat get dropped off into this pool here. We can take this conveyor loader that is not accessible by this auto sweeper and say any bristle berries or sleet wheat that end up in this evolution chamber get transferred over to the deep freezer. And all the finished foods will go from here into this conveyor loader into the deep freezer. A little bit complicated, but until we get some solid filters, this is the best way we can do it while also conserving how much ore we're spending on rail runs. Now right now this metal tile is only down to minus 15 and the food is slowly lowering in temps, which means there's a chance we might still get some rot piles in here. So in order to make sure those are cleaned out, we have a storage bin here that I typically call our trash can. We'll put it on a one and say any polluted dirt and rot pile. It'll all be loaded up in there and then we can take it and eventually feed it to the lobsters. Update on the oxygen, it's all coming out between 11 and 15 degrees, and our thermo aqua tuner is only having to run on average of 11% of the time. So it looks like we're gonna end up keeping this bomb after all. Angry Forest has about five cycles worth of oxygen remaining, plus another full cycles worth inside the Atmo suit. And it's a good thing too, because we almost have enough data banks 
to complete all the tier 4 research. I'm not gonna forget about you, buddy. I promise. Maybe. A bit of a hodgepodge episode, I know, to the point that I don't even know what I'm gonna put on the thumbnail yet. As a reminder, if you're looking for something to comment on the video, which we all know the YouTube algorithm absolutely loves, please figure out a name for the nuclear power plant industrial sauna and water purification system, because that's a bit of a mouthful. So until next time, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.